statistical mathematical fact. Never has been down. Has broken every single record. There is no asset that has come close. It's the only thing in the industry that was not touched, that was not hacked, and it never fails doing what it promised in 2009. It's never What's failed. the best performing asset the world has ever seen? And you'll find out that it's Bitcoin. Each and every space that I have on Twitter does wind up on my podcast, Bitcoin Unleashed. And um, if you find anything of interest in today's talk, I strongly encourage that you basically follow me on my podcast, Bitcoin Unleashed, which you can find on Spotify. You can find on the Fountain app where you can earn free sats listening to some of the episodes. Um, you can also find Bitcoin Unleashed in podcast form on YouTube and a variety of other outlets and more to come. All right. Um, what I like about the Fountain app, guys, is that it allows me to take these small clips, eight minutes, four minutes, two minutes, very important power pack clips. Um, from the long form episodes. And sometimes it's just better to consume some of these things in these bite size um, amounts. And so I like the fact that Fountain App does allow me to do that. In addition to that, I like the fact that Fountain App is a way for us to earn free free satoshis which i do not believe will exist forever you see guys there was a time when um there was something that gavin i can't i always have a problem with this guy's name but gavin andreessen who worked relatively closely with satoshi back in the old days he actually formed something called the bitcoin faucet and you can actually look this up right now as I as I speak about this. He formed the Bitcoin faucet to give greater visibility um, to Bitcoin at the time. I believe, I can't remember, but I believe it was as early as 2011. At any rate, maybe late 2010, but at any rate, don't quote me on the year, but it was very early in um, Bitcoin's life. and. All you had to do was show up to this website called the Bitcoin Faucet, I believe it was, and provide an email and solve a capture. You know what a capture is, where you know you have these squiggly and squiggly this squiggly code. Uh, that's a small C. That's a capital H. That's a star. That's a number one. And if you solve this capture and provided a Bitcoin receive address you would receive 50 free Bitcoin at the time. And over time, that free Bitcoin went from 50 free Bitcoin to fewer Bitcoin. But the point I'm trying to say is that Gavin had to basically beg people to show up to this website to get 50 free Bitcoin. Imagine that. And the reason because the reason why he had a hard time getting people to show up to even receive free Bitcoin is because the monetary value for the unit at the time from a from a US dollar perspective was relatively small. And so people didn't bother him like, eh. And that's the same mistake that people are making with these services today that offer another form of a Bitcoin faucet. And so, you know, you have this app, Fountain app, which is giving you free Bitcoin to listen to not only just Bitcoin content, but thousands of other podcasts and to receive Bitcoin just simply for to receive free Satoshis for simply listening. And I can't get you guys to show up just like Gavin couldn't get you to show up to receive free 50 free Bitcoin. And. I believe that you and many others are making the same mistake that people made back then. You see, you guys poo-poo the people who didn't show up to receive 50 free Bitcoin, but you're yet doing the same thing with the smaller unit called Satoshis. There will be a day that you see where 
you see in your lifetime, not your kids' lifetimes, in my opinion, not your grandkids' lifetime, you'll see a day where you regret not receiving free Satoshis. You will witness a day in your lifetime where a Satoshi is not that small. It's still going to be small in your life, but it's not going to be that small. And you're going to realize like, whoa, I gave up all of these, these opportunities in the early days because we're still early or you just didn't take advantage of that. So you, many of you are making the same mistake. So what am I saying? Get your asses over there. That's what I'm saying. Get on that fountain app, receive free Bitcoin, listen to my talks. If you so desire or listen to other people's talks. You don't have to listen to mine. I'm saying listen to mine if you find something that, that I have something of value to say. But there are other people and other podcasts to listen to on that app as well. Take full advantage now. Let's not make, let's learn from the past. Let's learn from history. And let's not make the same mistake that some of the early plebs made back in the day. There are many people who really latched on to Bitcoin early in today, and the vast majority of them, guess what? They don't have Bitcoin today. Do you know why they don't have Bitcoin today? Because the narrative was different or because the value was so low that they weren't as careful with what they had. They put Bitcoin on some thumb drive and threw it in the drawer and lost it. They put had it on some computer, which they trashed at one point later or sold the computer to someone else. Because the monetary unit wasn't that big, there was not this extra carefulness to store it and protect it. In addition to that, the narrative at that time back in the past wasn't the narrative of, of, of Bitcoin being a store of value. It was to be used as cash. A lot of people took the title that Satoshi Nakamoto decided to label um, the white paper that Bitcoin was a peer-to-peer -peer cash network, and they took that literally. But I believe that Satoshi Nakamoto, in all of his wisdom or their wisdom or its wisdom, um, basically just used that title because it was the only way to get the attention of the cypherpunks of the day who were totally obsessed with creating an alternative to cash. So if he named it anything else, he couldn't get the attention of the people he needed to get the attention to. So what do you do? He marketed the, the, the whole Bitcoin network as something related to cash. But while that is the, that is true, um, in all of his work and in all of his writings, he's not really talking about it as a cash thing. So my point is, is that we can use the past as a, a learning mechanism. And I am flabbergasted over and over and over again throughout my entire career how many people don't use the past and I'm also flabbergasted and blown away by how many people have no concept of what the past is. You see, people, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've come from, right? And if we're to take this seriously, we have to know where this has been. We have to know the mistakes that have been made in the past by others and by our own selves as well. And so... We have to always keep our finger on history. We have to always keep our finger on what has happened because at the end of the day, the only thing we have is the past. The only thing you have as a metric to work off of is what has happened before. If you don't use what's happened before to help you create a framework for going forward in your life, then everything just becomes a freaking ignorant guess. I am constantly bombarded by people who say, well, Oliver, oh, Oliver, the uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results. I know that, you bozo, but what else do we have? Oliver, but the I know the past was this, but it's, it's, how do we know it's going to be the same? We don't know, but what 
the heck else do we have to use? Nothing. So we've got to use what we have, guys. And the only thing we have is the past. All right. That's my little monologue today. And it's a perfect segue. That's my, that's my intro to my monologue today. It's a perfect segue into what I want to talk to you about today because I was sitting last night and pondering all of the things that I took a group of Bitcoiners of my own three years ago to start this journey. There was, um, there, at one point, there were 9,000 of us. Now, most of these come from my, my, my trading world. Um, these are my traders, my followers, people who have been with me, guys, since the middle of the 1990s. I've got people who have been close to me, have been following me, have been part of my work for decades. And when I announced that I was going to finally enter the Bitcoin realm, um, it excited a lot of people because a, a, a lot of my following, a lot of my traders understood my disdain for them getting involved with it. And I, I am almost shameful to say that I let a number of traders go simply because they wouldn't stop talking about it back in night in 2017 in particular. And, um, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed to say that I did that, that I had a policy in my company that there was to be no talk <clears throat> and no promotion of Bitcoin. And it's simply because I thought it was a distraction away from what we were really doing. And at the time I did this, um, we were experiencing some of the best um, gains of, 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 of my entire career. And I thought this thing called Bitcoin was just basically um, doing nothing more than um, creating another layer of confusion and distraction away from what we were doing at the time. And But all of that fanfare did make me look closer and when I looked closer, Bitcoin was approaching um, $20,000 at the time. And quite naturally, that's when I was hearing about it the most. You always hear about something the most when it's long past the time to be part of it. And I would always tell my traders, guys, that look, you're, 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 you're begging me to get involved with something that has been running this long and is this far away from the origin of that run. What have I taught you? You, Some of you have been with me for decades. Why are you doing this? This is stupid. This is dumb. This move is over. So what I ultimately began to do, because people just wouldn't shut up about it, I began to watch it a little carefully and more carefully. And what I did at the time was I told my traders that we need this to crash. If we're going to get involved with it in the future, I've got to see this survive another crash. So, and I told them, I'm not touching this until it crashes. I'm not even going to consider it until it falls back. And so I did some ancillary study at that particular point on Bitcoin. And I announced, this comes to my first prediction, by the way, I said that based on my brief study of what Bitcoin has done in the past, remember, all we have is the past. There's no guarantee that it's going to happen that way, but it's the only thing you have, so you've got to use it. So I used the past, and I said that Bitcoin has an average decline of 85%. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the 19.5, the almost $20,000, we're going to calculate an 85% decline from this point. That gives us around $3,000 a coin. I need this thing to drop toward $3,000. And so my talk here today for you is to share with you a variety of predictions that I made over three years ago. And what I want to tell you about this before I delve into them is that um, I want you to realize that the more I understand about Bitcoin today, the deeper and deeper I go down the rabbit hole, the more I realize how silly predictions really are. Now, this is, I'm sharing things that I did three plus years ago, all right? Um, 
uh, three years, even beyond three years ago. But I do want you to understand that today I shy away from these predictions because the more and more I believe that I understand about Bitcoin, the deeper I go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, the more I realize that predictions are dumb. Now, you can have fun with them. All right. And in that case, you know, a little bit of humor is not dumb. We need humor in life, but it's they're not necessary. So I want you to understand that um, Bitcoin has removed the need for humans to guess today. And a lot of people don't see it this way yet, but I believe that they will. You see, Bitcoin has brought about a certainty to our lives that we've never experienced by removing freedom out of the hands of human beings and placing it in maths. You see, we have been forced to rely on human beings throughout most of humanity. Most of humanity's history is rooted in the need to rely on another man, to rely on another man's item, to rely on another man's asset that he controls, to rely on another person's or another entity's money that he controls and manipulates. We have been indoctrinated to hand over our lives, our well, our wealth, our, our work to other men. And this has failed over and over and over again. It's not life as much. It's not that life is uncertain as much as human beings are the uncertain element in life. And Bitcoin removes the human element out of the future and places Everything in maths, which is a part of the universe. And because of this, there is no need to predict today. Because of this certainty, there's no need to guess today. And I believe that over time, we're going to trust this certainty that Bitcoin brings to us more and more. And we'll be able to rest and relax in the comfort of the certainty of maths, all right? Now, that's not to say that I do believe that predictions are silly today, but that's not to say that frameworks are. Now, there's a difference between having a framework, all right, and having a prediction. And I wanna briefly explain that before I delve into these past predictions that I made, right? Frameworks are necessary, frameworks are necessary in my view. Predictions are not. So as an example of the difference, let's consider this. This is a prediction. I predict that it will rain today at 2.17 p.m. In this area of the world, in my area of the world, all right, that is a prediction. A framework, conversely, is um, there's a decent chance it might rain today. So you know what? I'm going to bring an umbrella. So one is trying to predict something specific, and it's just not necessary. I'll bring an umbrella. It's some chances of rain. It's a chance. I'll bring an umbrella. If it rains, cool, I've got an umbrella. If it doesn't, cool, I've got a nice walking stick or something I'll just throw in my bag or something like that. And so there's a difference between a prediction and a framework. We need frameworks to work through life. All right. A frame, another example of a framework is mapping out your day. All right. I'm going to go to the gym. I, Life is open to us every single day, but we add a framework around our lives by putting structure in place. All right. All right. Um, and, you know, I'll go to the gym at this time. I'll, you know, uh, I'll, I'll finish reading. I'll, I'll finish the last chapter of this book I'm reading tonight. And you know what I'm saying? We That's a framework added to an open protocol called life. So we need frameworks. We don't need predictions. All right. I predict the end of the world is going to, we don't need that. 
So I do want you to understand the difference between a prediction and a framework. Now, with all of this said, as I mentioned, I made a battery of predictions before I arrived at this point of realizing that predictions are kind of stupid. Um, it's these I want to share with you. Now, many of these predictions came true. A few did not, but actually still may. But I want to say this. The accuracy that you're going to see in the predictions that I share with you, right? The accuracy you'll see, it's not some special magic. It's not some special great skill. You're going to see a high degree of accuracy in these predictions. But I don't want you to mistake it for that. It's not that. It's not some magic. It's not some special skill or anything like that. This, the accuracy of these things just largely come from my experience being in the financial space for four decades. I've been a part of this machinery a very long time, and I know how the machine works. That's it. Nothing else. Any other astute watcher of the game for four decades, I've been at this for four decades, could have done the very same thing that I did. So I don't want you to play some over some unwarranted importance on top of these things that have basically come true. Lastly, I will say that every single prediction I share with you today can be backed up and, and corroborated by thousands of Bitcoiners in my private club. I am telling you, some of them might be listening here today. All right. There is nothing that I'm going to share with you that is false. These were actually things three plus years ago that I said would happen. And I'll share a few things that haven't happened as yet. So everything you hear from me here today is true. I do, for anyone who's listening to me for the first time, guys, I don't pass the mic. So you're, um, I feel that the, the, the most beneficial way that I share my 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 limited information and knowledge is basically to talk to you in a monologue form. All right. It's just the way it is. Perhaps sometime in the future, I'll pass the mic, but um, I will try to take some questions. Sometimes when I go too long, I'm not able to do that. But um, I just want to let you know that up front. Okay. Prediction number one, which I actually started sharing with you. So we were at $20,000 in late 2017, right? Near 20,000. And I told my traders that we need this thing to fall back. And based on my preliminary work on Bitcoin, we needed to, to crack toward 3,000. And so my traders were like, well, why 3,000? Because I said, I've done just rudimentary analysis on every single decline of Bitcoin in the past and come up with an average of about 85%. That brings us down to 3,000. So I'm not getting involved until I see that again or something close to it. And lo and behold, Bitcoin cracked toward 3,000. Now, it actually bottomed out in 2018 at 3,200, if my memory serves me correctly. All right. So while my traders are like, wow, that's wow, that's incredible, Oliver. You called that a long time ago. You called that a year ago, whatever the case was. I did monitor periodically Bitcoin's descent down to that level. But what I also told my traders, and this is something that I teach them all the time, is that the first move up from a bottom when you crash hard like that is not the one that you get into in a very big way. All right that you want the secondary drop that occurs to be the one. So um, my traders will tell you that we have this, we have this method of, of, of knowing or expecting the initial rally to the upside. As an example, don't get your panties in a bunch about this, this analogy. Okay. Um, but if a dead cat, if you were to drop a cat from a from a tall building and the cat hit the ground, the cat's basically dead. The body or the carcass of the cat might bounce, but that's not what you confuse as life. And so this bounce typically of the dead carcass 
typically bounces about 50 to to 60% of the way back up. And so my second prediction was that once Bitcoin does bottom, it would have about a 50 to 60% rally to the upside and then start moving back to the downside again. And so that's pretty much what happened. Bitcoin bottomed at 3,200. It rallied to around 14,000. So the area I had was around 12,000 and a half, 13,000. We overshot that a tiny bit, 14,000, and then dropped back. Now, that was prediction number two that came true. Prediction number three was when we move back to the downside, that's when we're going to pile in in a very, very big way. Now, this pullback this secondary pullback from that 50% rally, we we don't want it to break the low of the previous drop at 3,200. And typically, these pullbacks come back about 50 to 60% of the way back down. And so my prediction was $6,000 per Bitcoin, more or less, from the $14,000 high. And so um, when Bitcoin dropped to that was prediction number two that came came prediction number three that came back, came came to pass. And then I told them that if we drop, if any additional drop below six thousand, that's incredible. That's an incredible gift zone. So my view was anything in the five to four thousand dollar range because that's below 6,000, that that was institutional accumulation zone. And so when Bitcoin dropped and cracked 6,000, um, and on, I remember this day like it was yesterday, guys, and I have a video to prove it to you. As a matter of fact, right after this episode, right after this talk, I'm going to share the video with you where I'm announcing I recorded this. I'm announcing to my traders, today's the day. And the day was when it broke 6,000. That was on March um, two, March 12th, 2020. And for several days after, for, from as the two heavy buy days were March 12th and March 13th on all of our parts. They were already expecting this. They were already planning. 6,000 had already been marked at the $14,000 level. All right. And the crack of 6,000 put thousands of traders at work accumulating Bitcoin at 58, 53. We have this model of accumulating at eights and threes. So the way we do it is we buy the eight and three. So we buy 5,008, we buy 5,003. Then we buy 4,008 and we buy 4,003. Then we buy 3,008 and then we buy 3,003. So we purchase on the eights and the threes. Okay, we don't purchase on round numbers. That's for novices. Okay. So this was the third um, prediction that came true, and it got us the bottom, the lowest price, which was the heaviest price of all we got, all right, was 3008 We got the 3008 low because our institutional style accumulation method is to buy the eights and threes. And the low just happened to be around that eight. All right. So that's prediction three that came to pass. And at the time, I would say at that time, I had 6,000 traders buying Bitcoin, um, under 6,000 all the way down. And that number rose to nine as we came off of that low. So more. Tr- traders joined in um, to the journey because they're like, holy shit, Oliver has this thing freaking on lock. All right. Anyway, that was, that was the third prediction. So we got right there. Now, what are the following predictions after that? My first price prediction was 40,000. And I will tell you that 
everyone thought I was crazy. I call the the drop to 3000. I call the rally halfway back up. I call the drop all the way back down. I call the 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 gift zone below 6000. All right. Um but they still called me crazy when I called for a price after that of 40,000. Now, I didn't just call 40,000 I call 40,000 as the place that Bitcoin would actually stall and start to ramble around, pull back, maybe even drop quite significantly from there. So I called a temporary top around 40,000. I think I got that pretty good because I think I can't remember, but I think it was 38,000 or so. So I, I, I consider that as a pretty accurate call on that prediction. All right. So then I predicted after we achieved our, that prediction, you know, and I'm still studying the past on Bitcoin. And I'm like, this is not even close to what the historical runs have been from a cycle low in Bitcoin, we're going higher than 40. And so I are like, but Oliver, how can it go higher than 40? I'm like, I'm look, I'm looking, look at the past. This isn't, this is not even close to what it should be, should be at. This is like halfway. And so my traders were like halfway, Oliver. I'm like, yes, this is halfway. So after it achieved 40,000, I came up with the secondary target 74. And once again, my trader said, Oliver, come on, 74? That's insane. I'm like, I, I don't make the rules, dude. I'm just looking at the past. That's the only thing we have, right? And the past suggests that even 74 is soft. But let's just make it 74. So we made the next prediction. This is the fifth prediction now, I believe I'm going, to 74. Now, of course, most people listening to me now know that we never got to 74. There was an interrupt that I believe prevented us from getting to that price, which was the Bitcoin mining ban that happened in May of 2021. That came out of left field. That can legitimately be called a black swan event that interrupted the flow that was going on. It put a big jolt into the system, into the network. The Bitcoin hash rate got cut in half. And if you recall at the time, China had basically were responsible for the lion's share of Bitcoin's hash rate at the time. And it, I believe it was a close to 60%. And that had come down from something like 80, 85%. But they still had the lion's share of the Bitcoin hash rate. And so with that Bitcoin mining ban, it cut the hash rate practically in half. And that's almost like, imagine you losing half of your strength, half of your energy, half of your body. You understand? And so coming Bitcoin did ultimately come back from that quite nicely, impressively, unbelievably. In fact, it still lost half of its momentum, half of its life, half of its energy. So in retrospect, I'm not surprised that after the drop from 64 at the time, Bitcoin mining ban in China, half the hash rate gets cut, drop to 28,000. All right. Now, here comes the next prediction. And this one was the first one I got wrong. As Bitcoin began to climb more impressively than I ever thought was possible from the 28,000 level. Remember, we topped out at 64 because of the China ban. That, that should have run further, actually. So we topped out there. The China ban put a halt on that rally. It dropped it all the way back to 28,000 at the that it made a low around 28,000. I wanted to monitor how this thing started to move up from this $20,000 low. The quality of a move up really 
has a lot of clues in it. What kind of velocity? What kind of is is it a dead cat bounce or is this thing just marching? Like I'm not dead, I'm coming back to get you. And so Bitcoin did just that. It didn't bounce up like it was a dead cat bounce. It didn't bounce up the same way it bounced off of 3200 all the way back to 14,000 at the low before. It started marching like relentlessly, consistently, steadily, like a freaking locomotive. I was so impressed. You have no idea. And so what this, the quality of that comeback, what it made me do is up my target. And this was the first failed prediction. I upped my target from 74 to 105 to 108. Now, if anyone who's been with me for a while, they remember these numbers. You know, like, Oliver, you think you, you think you can get there? Didn't get to the 74. I'm like, remember I told you the 74 was soft, right? So this thing is so impressive. I think it's going to blow past that. We're going to, 10, we're going to 105, 108. Of course, now we see that it didn't. We topped out around 69. So we almost hit that 74. And of course, the, the cycle was over and Bitcoin went into its typical one year bear market from there. So I was wrong in, in that I was wrong to raise in hindsight that target. And what can I learn from that? Because I'm doing this to know what can we learn from this? What I learned when I sat down with that error, because I am not wrong very often. And when I am, I really sit down with it, right? So I sat down with this thing. How could I be so off with this? And I realized my, my error. You see, Bitcoin had to double dip because of the China ban. So I want you to imagine that if Bitcoin didn't, Bitcoin ran to 64. So imagine a, a marathon runner who's in first place. They're running a 100 mile run. And at the 64th mile, there's no one in sight. I mean, the second place is very far behind first place marathon runner. And maybe the second place is at 25, mile 25, and Bitcoin is at mile 64. 100 miles wins the race. But then the organizers of the marathon say, wait a minute, you have to go all the way back to mile 28. And can you imagine the, 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 the marathon runner in the lead says, what? They're like, no, 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 this is too unfair. We want to make the race more competitive. So go stop your stop your running. I want you to go all the way back to mile 28 and start again from there to give the others a chance to make this marathon more competitive. And so if you were to do that with a marathon runner, of course, the power, energy, and strength that the marathon runner would have used to continue from 64 onward has to now be used to repeat 28 all the way back to 64 again. So the double dipping into Bitcoin's energy that way prevented it from that effort being applied on top of 64. If you put the effort that Bitcoin had to repeat from 28 all the way back to 20 to 64 again, and you put that on top of 64, then you get my target of 108, 105. And so that was the error that I made, not accounting for the fact that Bitcoin had to go all the way back to mile 28 and use the energy it should have used for the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. It had to use it again for the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. And so by the time it reached its original top, the marathon runner was a little more spent. 
And so that's the error that I believe I made in upping from 74 to 105. And of course, we had I had big lessons with this with my with with my traders on this. And so that's an error that I won't make anymore. All right. Um so that's the whole point, guys, is to we have to we have to learn from the errors of other people. Like I was saying, the errors of the plebs in the past, the errors of people who poo-pooed getting free 50 Bitcoin because it was worth a penny or two cents or whatever. Um, these were errors that should not, I mean, we we can learn from today. So don't poo-poo free Satoshis today. And we also need to learn from the errors that we make personally ourselves. And this was one of mine, and I've learned from it. All right? Let me shake my thing up here. I'm having a little shake here, guys. I hope you don't mind. Um, all right. So now I want to take you into the next phase of predictions that I made. Um. I want to take you to the next phase because in truth it's these predictions that i found the most interesting for myself all right price predictions i've been doing for four decades 40 years it's just a natural part of my work my whole life but it's the political and global predictions that I find the most interesting, and I made them three years ago regarding Bitcoin as well. You see, as this was all going on, I was getting pulled deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. And, um, and my conviction regarding this thing and how special it was, was just rising off of the charts. And so... I actually told my group three years ago, we're talking 2021, right? This is right after the China ban. So China bans mining. And I tell my group, that's the end of China controlling the Bitcoin hash rate. China just gave the United States Bitcoin. My traders are like, what? What are you saying, Oliver? Yes. Are you saying, Oliver, are you saying that countries are vying for Bitcoin? I'm like, no, America is vying for Bitcoin. So my traders are like, Oliver, come on, man. They hate Bitcoin. They want to ban it. I'm like, no, that's all rhetoric. That's all for show. They want it. My traders are like, Oliver, are you sure? I'm like, watch what happens. Watch America, watch the United States take the position of China now. They, that was a major faux pas. Faux, what is the word? How do you pronounce it? Faux pas. <laughs> All right. A major error by China. They gave up something that they don't know the power of. They gave up their leading spot. On the hash rate, watch it go to the United States. And lo and behold, first, the majority of the miners unplugged from China. Then they went, the majority went to Kazakhstan. And so my traders were like, Oliver, you're wrong. They're not going to the United States. They're going to Kazakhstan right next door to China. And I'm like, shoot, am I wrong? Maybe I am wrong. That does make sense to go to Kazakhstan, and then boom, Kazakhstan, shortly after receiving a ton of miners from China, their entire country's electric grid goes down. And I come back with my chest puffed out, and I said, see, aha, aha. Now, I told them, you think that just when they received the vast majority of the unplugged miners from China scurrying to Kazakhstan to replug their machines, their miners, you think that this is by chance that the electric grid goes out? Of all the moments in time, of all the time 
in the world, throughout life, that the Kazakhstan electrical grid could go down and went down now? Like that, you think that's, guys, I'm like, this is too big for things to happen by chance. This is not chance. Now watch them scurry to the United States. And they did. And to this very day, America, the United States, has the largest they they are responsible for more of bitcoin's hash rate than any other country in the world china is still number 3 i believe if i'm not mistaken but america grabs has grabbed number 1 and they're never letting it go never never watch this i'm telling you this i'm not making another prediction i'm just l- still maintaining the prediction i had before America will never lose its lead. It will never allow that lead to ever go away again. Not in recent times anyway. It might happen over a long period of time by osmosis or what have you, but it is not intended to happen. I told my traders that America wants Bitcoin. America is after Bitcoin. They know they can't control it, but the things that they can get, they're going to get. The United States is is a country that that owns more Bitcoin than virtually every country on earth. Why do you think that is? Today, the United States has the vast majority of the the mining hash rate. Why do you think Wall Street has so aggressively supported publicly traded mining companies? The United States wants Bitcoin. All of this talk about it not being good is just a smokescreen. They want it. They understand the importance. They are not dropping the ball. That's the smokescreen. They're grabbing the ball and running full freaking speed ahead. You don't watch what people say. They put clowns on stages in 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 um Congress and in in the Senate to say all of these stupid things while their actions show everything different. The actions of I hold more bitcoin than any other country. What does that action tell you? While they put bozos to write articles and this and that, what's the actions? We're welcoming all the Bitcoiners from around the world. Right? Our our um our biggest oil companies are mining Bitcoin. Meanwhile, all of this rhetoric is negative, but the actions are not negative at all. So that prediction came true. All right. Um, I told them when, as soon the day they did that, I'm like, China just lost. China just lost their lead forever. And I did a special session with them on this to go over the history of China fucking up throughout many times throughout their history. And the history I share with them is when they fail to move to the gold standard because they were, they had such a dominant position in silver and their country um, had a, their, their country had a surplus because of silver. Silver was their economic power. So adopting gold didn't make sense to them, and they refused to adopt a stronger, harder, scarcer money. And China went from being on top of the world to being on the bottom of the world because they failed to move to the better money. And this is historical. Bitcoin is the better money, and anyone who fails to move to the better money ultimately moves from the top to the bottom. It is historical. It has happened every single time in human history. And so China made another error by giving up a power they didn't realize was a superpower, having dominance, dominating the 
being responsible, I should say, for the vast majority of the Bitcoin hash rate. Now, understand, this doesn't give America any control over Bitcoin whatsoever. It does give it clout, though. It does give it clout. All right. The next, the next prediction I made. All right, guys, I know I'm going to upset some people here. How many people do I have? Let me see how many people. Because I, I, I imagine I'm going to upset 20% of the people here. They're going to be angry with me. All right. There's about 120 people here, maybe 130, 40. I don't know, something like that. So 20% of the people are going to be upset with me. All right. Now I'm going to apologize in advance for this because I know you're going to be pissed. I predicted also right after the China ban that the next step, no, right after it was clear that the miners were migrating to America in large part. The next thing I predicted was CZ of Binance is going to be taken out. No one believed me. Oliver, come on. He's the most dominant dude in the space. He's got the biggest exchange by far. Binance is the Bitcoin of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. What are you talking about, Oliver? Nope, nope, nope. Now, listen, guys, I want you to listen to me carefully. I want you to listen to me. I am Latin and African American. My last name is Velez. Most people throughout my life, despite my last name being Velez, has basically referred to me as an African American. I am a minority or considered a minority in the United States. Now, I will tell you that I, because of that, I am sensitive and sympathetic to discrimination. I'm telling you this, despite the fact that I, I have never felt in my entire life that I've ever been the victim of racial anything. I probably, to if I ever have experienced racial discrimination, if I ever have in my entire life, I was probably too cocky to realize that it was going on. I was cocky, guys. You think I'm cocky now? Oh, my God. I'm a humble old man now. You don't want to know me when I was in my 20s and early 30s. I was freaking cocky. All right? I will tell you that. So I have never felt like I've experienced. I'm just putting that out there. I've never felt like experienced racial anything. Anything. And if I did, I was probably too cocky to understand what was going on anyway. All right. So I say that to say this, because what I'm about to say might seem racial. What I told my traders is that there's no way that if America is after Bitcoin, they are going to allow a person that has China roots, a Chinaman. They're not going to allow it. I'm telling you, they're not going to allow someone that is Chinese to control what they want. It's not going to happen. And people would say, but Oliver, but Oliver, but Oliver this and Oliver, I'm saying it's not going to happen. I'm sorry, Oliver, you're being racial. I'm not being racial. I'm being freaking realistic. It's not going to happen. They're going to take him out. That prediction came true. All right. Now, what, did I get wrong here, but may happen. And I told them, and Binance is going to. Oliver, come on. Binance makes zillions of dollars. I'm saying they're gone. Now, this is Bin CZ and Binance are on top of the world. After this, CZ gets put on the freaking cover. I don't know if it was after or before, but he was on the freaking cover of Fortune, which which is a death knell, by the way. I don't know if you've ever studied the history of covers of Forbes. If you wind up on the cover of Forbes, you're done. That's your top tick. Your life is ruined from there. It's all downhill. So did I get Binance wrong? Maybe. But they're not, they're going to be a remnant of what they used to be. That I can promise. 
That I believe. But I did predict that they would be taken out. That CZ would be taken out first and that Binance would be taken out second. Came true. I hope I didn't offend anybody with that, but that was one of my predictions. I predicted that when FTX blew up and CZ was involved in igniting that, my prediction was, all right, I already told you that CZ is going to be taken out. They're going to use this with SBF and FTX. They're going to group them to together. They're going to use this as an excuse to they're going to use this as an excuse as the fall guys for the big guys to come in and take over the space this is the next step i predicted this i said here it is this is the opportunity they're going to cz started the ball rolling to the downside they're going to use sbf all right they're going to take him out. They're going to take FTX out. They're going to take CZ out at the same time. And boom, they're going to come in for the rescue with the big tr trad five Wall Street's going to come to save the freaking day. I told them all of this is planned. And that pretty much happened because right after, shortly after the FTX blow up, Larry Fink's BlackRock announces in August. So the blow up happened in July, I believe, June, July. The, the very next month, BlackRock announces we've started a private Bitcoin fund for our special clients. I'm like, here it comes. After this, I believe, was August, I want to say 15th. It could have been later, 21st. Anyway, my memory fails me. Late August, BlackRock announces this private fund. Now, at the time, I remember this specifically. Bitcoin's at 21,000, 20,000 or so. But the shoe hasn't dropped far enough. So at this particular point, I'm like, okay. Now, ETFs get approved in 2024. I swear to God to you guys, 2024, my traders, my Bitcoiners can tell you, Oliver said this, 2024, Bitcoin ETFs get approved. This is the first step. BlackRock forms a quasi ETF for itself and its private clients, and it's doing it as it's approaching Bitcoin's historical 85% drawdown, but it wasn't quite there. It was at 20. So I'm like, the final shoe has to drop with SBF, SBF and CZ. That's going to take it lower. They're getting in now. They're forming this now to grab the bottom. Now, remember I told you that study that I did where the average decline is 85%, right? But you have to also look that each decline that Bitcoin has ever had is shallower. So what I told my traders is that we're not getting 85%. We're getting 80%. And lo and behold, we bottomed out at 78%. And I'm like, so I told him, BlackRock is forming this at 2021. They expect slightly lower prices. So expect the shoe to drop with CZ and SBF. That's going to drop this thing. Yes, we're going to break the we're going to break the 200 period weekly 200 period moving average again. We're going to drop again and they're going to gobble up. This fund is being prepared to gobble up the next dump. Because institutions, they don't get into something to buy it on the way up. They get into something to get in on the way down. That's what threw a lot of people with the ETF approvals. See, the the. Bitcoin dropping after the approvals is the most positive thing that can happen because that's how institutions like to get in. You're not getting them to, to write checks when something's skyrocketing to the upside. We don't do that. 
So if you want, if, if, if anybody wants these ETFs to be successful, if anybody wants the institutional crowd to come into this thing, you want Bitcoin to go down first, not up. They're not going to join up. They're going to join down. And so I predicted one last drop, one last dump because BlackRock formed around the 20th or so of August. They're expecting one more dump. You don't form this. You don't form this when you're expecting it to move up. You form this when you're expecting one last dump. So watch the SBF CZ dump. And boom, we got it. And I will tell you, I came here, guys, on Twitter. I was showing you gobbling Bitcoin. Some of you said, well, Oliver, man, damn, you you pick up Bitcoin like crazy. Dude, you have no clue. First of all, I don't show you the Bitcoin. I show you a little bit of what I do. Secondly, as it was not even close to what I was doing 16 high 15, 16, 17, 18. I was a freaking madman. We all were because we framed this out based on my theory that BlackRock is ushering in ETFs and they're starting with this vehicle. And that I know how institutions start things. They start things before they go up. Not Now, I know they're getting in way off the bottom, but remember, Bitcoin... BlackRock got the bottom. They got the bottom with the with Act One. They're now bringing the public in on Act Two to join them in the forty thousands. But they grabbed the bottom. Don't misunderstand that. They grabbed the bottom with forming their entity in August of twenty twenty two. All right. The bottom occurred in November. It's only a couple months. They gobble that whole drop up. Just like I did. I was right next to them. I was waving at 15. Remember I told you how I accumulate 15.8. I was waving to them at 15,800. Hey, Larry. I said, dude, I know Larry was like looking at me at 15.8 and saying, damn, this dude is always here. (laughs) <laughs> yes, that's right. About all the way down. Eight, three. 17, eight, 17, three. 16, eight, 16, three. You know the deal now. I've already explained that to you. And the lowest price I got was 15, eight. All right. So that's another prediction that came, came through. CZ gets taken out. Well, the drop happens. The FTX SBF bomb hits. Another drop happens. We we break 16 momentarily. BlackRock gobbles that up. They start preparing for phase two launching because the, the game on Wall Street, guys, is to you get in first and then you offer it. BlackRock and their special clients got in first in August of 2022. Now, in 2024, they're offering it. That's just a blueprint, man, that I've experienced my whole career. I know the blueprint. I know how this goes. All right? All right. What else did I predict? I predicted that this was a prediction that is not true, that did not come true yet, but probably won't. I don't know. Anyway, this one I was wrong with. I predicted to my got my my Bitcoiners that GBTC would be dismantled. Yep. So was I wrong? Looks like it. But I predicted that GPTC would be a mantle. Because remember, I want you to get into my mindset. America's coming after Bitcoin. They grab mining. They support mining stocks. 
They send hundreds of millions of dollars to mining stocks to make sure they maintain control of the Bitcoin hash rate. If you were to look at the top owners of all of the top 10 publicly traded miners, who's the owners? All the biggest financial entities in America. BlackRock, Vanguard, Vanguard. I don't know if Vanguard owns miners, but I know they own MicroStrategy. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that they're, the miners are supported by Wall Street to ensure that the hash rate doesn't go anywhere. Do you understand this, guys? It's not for that we're going to make a few dollars. That too. They're going to make a few dollars too, but it's to make sure that hash rate doesn't go anywhere. Do you understand this? This is chess. It's not freaking checkers. This is too big to be to have the game just reduced to making fiat dollars. That can be freaking printed, right? It's not just about dollars. It's about dominance. And so they're dominating Bitcoin mining, dominating the Bitcoin hash rate, which gives them no control. Don't confuse the dominance of that with dominance of the Bitcoin network. You can't dominate Bitcoin. So let's not get it twisted. Um, the big guys are coming in to save the day from the Sam, the 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 scam bankrupt fra frauds of the world, the SBFs of the world, the CZs of the world that are taking them out. They're going to use their entity, which they control, Coinbase, to be their wet boy, right? to be the bench boy, to be the water boy, right? Coinbase is the water boy, all right? Hold my stuff. You understand? I'll do the work. You just hold my stuff for me. And by the way, I own a big chunk of the company, right? So that's the game being played there in my view, right? Now, uh, my prediction of GBTC being taken out, right, grayscale Bitcoin trust, is because the big boys want that. The ETFs. The Black Rocks of the world, they want that. This is the largest holder of Bitcoin outside of Satoshi in the world. 600,000 plus Bitcoin. I believe there was an attempt to take it out. You know, the founder of Genesis is gone. They took him out. He's gone. Genesis took a big blow. The, 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 the corporate parent of GP, GBTC. Boom. And I think sometimes a lot of this confusion or a lot of this attempt with the cash create versus the in-kind ETF thing was basically to put pressure on GBTC to lose dominance in the space. Could I be wrong? Yes. Am I wrong so far? Yes. They haven't been taken out. If I do wind up being wrong, they will be a remnant of what they used to be. That is my view, and I'm sticking to it. All right. Exchanges. I made a prediction three plus years ago. Guys, exchanges are going to go away. They're like, Oliver, come on. Cryptocurrency exchange. Yes, they're going away. That is not a long-term business. I have lived this life myself. Listen, guys. I owned the second largest direct access brokerage firm in the United States. I know this business. I sold this thing for a zillion dollars, right? Back in the 1990s, think about how early this was. I had all the life, I had to get all the licenses or whatever. I owned the second largest direct access brokerage firm in the United States. 
And I'm telling you, I know how that business just squeezes on you until you're gone. The, the, you know, the, the spreads that you're able to benefit from, and I benefited huge from those spreads in the middle to late 1990s, right? Um, they just start shrinking rapidly on you until you're basically absorbed by you're either put out of business or you're absorbed. And so I saw the writing on the wall and just sold it. And this is the same thing that's going to happen to same thing's going to happen to, in my opinion, um, exchanges. Bitcoin exchanges are a very short-term phenomena because, like, you can't make money up doing that. The, 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 the spread goes to zero infinitely at a, exponentially at a certain point. There's no money in that over time. And so if these exchanges don't start branching off into ancillary things, that's why you see a lot of them starting to do shows or they're really like a media company or they get into custody or as they start doing services on top of Bitcoin, maybe it's multi-sig or maybe it's offering loans or whatever, because selling Bitcoin is going away. It's not, that's not a long-term business. You can see Coinbase's entire role having already transitioned. It's Waterboy. <laughs> and so, you know, that was a prediction of mine as well. And we'll see if that kind of pans out all the way. But I just don't see that as a long-term business. What's another prediction I made. You will see traditional TradFi banks and big financial firms, even the Wall Street ones, they will become custodians of Bitcoin. And they will start offering services. This is what I would tell my traders, that you won't ever have to sell your Bitcoin in the future because you'll just pick a custodian. And this custodian will give you anything on earth you want as long as they custody your Bitcoin. Now, that's dangerous. I'm not saying that's right to do, but... You're going to see, in my opinion, every one of these banks, it's going to be as normal as what you've seen for the last several decades. It's going to be normal to custody Bitcoin at a traditional financial organization. And with it parked there, with it custody there, you'll get a freaking blank check. Oh, you want that mansion on the hill? Okay. You want that brand new Ferrari? Okay. You want that trip around the world? Okay. Ah, oh, you're interested in that yacht. Yeah, that's a nice one. Okay. You'll be able to get anything on planet Earth you want if you have it in, in, in any fairly sufficient amount. These TradFi banks will then start to branch off divisions and become pure Bitcoin banks, pure, nothing else but Bitcoin. This prediction I made over three years ago, has it happened? No. Well, do I think it's going to happen? Yes. There will be a thing called Bitcoin banks where everything is connected to Bitcoin and you'll be able to get anything on planet Earth you want without ever really having to sell it. There will be all kinds of strategies put on top of Bitcoin and layers that allow you to do this and do that. Just because you have Bitcoin. If I owned a city block in Manhattan, I could walk in any financial institution in the world and get anything I want. Same thing, same models. It's not rocket science. 
It's just a different property, right? But a better one. All right. The ETF shares of the ETF. I want you to listen to me carefully. So I predicted that when the ETF goes live, this is three years ago, when we have an ETF, this is securitization of Bitcoin begins, right? So I'm drinking my shake here. The securitization of Bitcoin begins, right? So what happens is that all kinds of services get built on top of the security. So ETF shares are a security, but Bitcoin itself is not a security. And so what the ETF world, what the entities are going to do I want you to get this clearly in your head. You don't have to believe me or agree with it, but I do want you to understand what I see. What I see, based on my experience, is that the the benefits that share ETF shareholders are going to get are going to seemingly be more than the benefits that someone just self-custodying Bitcoin gets. They're going to make owning the shares of an ETF seem sexier, seem better. It's going to be like holding a freaking Black American Express card. Your benefits are going to be more. What you can do is going to be more than you can do with flat out own Bitcoin. They're going to send the message around the world that it is better to own a Bitcoin ETF share than it is to self custody your Bitcoin. That is the message that will be rolled out in a huge, huge way. And I'm telling you this on my watch. I'm not going to let you do that. Not on my watch. I'm not going to let them dangle some carrots in front of you when you freaking run after the carrot like you're a freaking bunny rabbit. No. I'm not going to let you be the the proverbial Indian who Indian who sold Manhattan for a pig in a blanket. You're, I'm not going to let that happen. Not on my watch. I'm not going to let someone come in and take your country for some cheap little trinkets. That's how Brazil, Brazil was lost to the Portuguese. You know that story. Correct me if I'm wrong, Brazilians. I could get this story wrong, but you know the story of how Brazil... Brazil's the only country in, in an, on an entire continent that does not speak Spanish. Spain conquered every region of an entire continent. My God, the Spain, the Spanish, they were vicious. Oh my God, do you know the history? Oh my God. They took no... They took no names, no prison. They just went for the kill. They dominated. Spain was vicious. But somehow, they couldn't take Brazil. Every time they'd send troops into Brazil, dead bodies would come back. The Brazilians were tough, man. They were un, un, They were underarmed. They weren't armed. They still beat them. They're like, how are these people killing our armed soldiers? They wouldn't relent. Brazilians are tough. I don't know if you know Brazilians. I know Brazilians. I have a whole operation in Brazil for the last 10 years. They're tough. But you know how they fell? They did not fall to the Spanish. They fell to the Portuguese. They fell to the Portuguese. So the Portuguese watched this and saw how Spain failed to take over this massive, resource-rich piece of 
land that was the largest of the entire continent. And so they came in with smiles. They came in with brochures, <laughs> ETF brochures. <laughs> the Portuguese came to the Brazilian warriors with ETF brochures and said, look, look at this. They basically came in with trinkets, cheap trinkets that bewildered the Brazilians. Their eyes lit up, these glittery pieces of junk. And they gave up their country for trinkets, willingly. I will not let that happen to you, not on my watch. You're not going to fall for this. You're going to own the land. You're not going to own a trinket. You're going to own the land. You're not going to own a pig in a blanket. You're going to own the Manhattan. Do you understand? You're not giving up Manhattan for a pig in a blanket. You're not giving up resource-rich Brazil for trinkets. You're going to own Brazil. You're going to own Manhattan. You're going to own the real thing. Make no mistake about it. All right. What I have here now. All right. I'm coming to the end here, guys. I promise. Um, three years ago, I made a prediction that Bitcoin would wipe out white, listen to me carefully, <laughs> that Bitcoin would wipe out a big firm or two on Wall Street, a venerable firm, a behemoth, that Bitcoin would take them down. Remember how no one thought that Bear Stearns a 100 plus year, 114 years or however many years they were in existence. I should know that. I worked for them. But Bear Stearns, nobody ever thought they were the kings, especially in the bond arena at one point. Kings of Wall Street. Out. Gone. Done. I was largely responsible for Jamie Dimon's ascent to stardom. Right. But I believed at the time, and I still do, that these guys are going to mess up. They're going to disrespect the power of Bitcoin and its, its immutability. They're going to disrespect the finite scarcity, which they're all not used to, none of us are, they're going to underestimate you and me. Because as we buy and pull it, pull Bitcoin out of circulation into our own self-custody, it squeezes them. They're going to underestimate you. They're going to underestimate me. And they're going to underestimate what finite scarcity is. They're going to underestimate the fact that you, that no matter how high the price goes, you can't create more. They're going to bring their Wall Street games to this and feel like they have it tamed for a while. And Bitcoin's going to wake up one day and say, enough. Boom! and take them out it might be a group of them it might be one giant vehemoth and let me tell you something else if I'm right when if I'm right and I believe I am if history's any god I am I use history if I am and when this happens bitcoin will take a massive dump and then go into a stratosphere you never thought existed. 
dump first, and then it will just freaking go into the stratosphere. A stratosphere you never thought existed. Prices that I just won't even be bold enough to mention here. That is my was my prediction three years ago, and I'm sticking with it. All right. Um, those were all the those were all of the predictions that I have I made um, three plus years ago. Many of them came true. A, f- a small few of them did not. But if you were to force me to continue this with more of a framework in mind, to continue predicting more of a framework in mind, I would just tell you this. I would say that if you were to put a gun to my head, I will tell you, I would tell you that Bitcoin breaks the seeming this seeming cycle of diminishing returns. You guys have all heard of that. Oh, Bitcoin's experiencing diminishing returns. Not really, but okay, let's go with that. That Bitcoin breaks the seeming the seeming cycle of diminishing returns and has a bigger than normal move to the upside this cycle. So if you to put a gun to my head, I will say that this move, this move up that we're going to experience into 2025 is going to be bigger on average than the prior moves. So it's going to snap and break this idea that Bitcoin is experiencing diminishing returns. That's if you put a gun to my head, I would tell you that. I would tell you that gold takes that that Bitcoin takes out gold the next cycle by a long shot, becoming the most valuable asset on earth. And I will tell you that the following cycle, so think about what I mean by cycles. Cycle ends in 2025, this one. And cycle, um, it depends on where you start. I end cycles at the bull run. So the bull run in, ends in late 2025. Um, but if you were to use cycles for have the having, which a lot of people, most people use the start of a cycle at the having. So the next cycle is the, the after this cycle, the next cycle is the 2028 cycle. That's taking out gold in, in a very significant way. And the next cycle is 2032, where uh, you're in the multi-millions of dollars a coin. That's if you put a gun to my head, I would say that. Now, I want to say this. Um, I have told my 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 Bitcoiners, my traders, that Veblen Veblen law is now set to take place with Bitcoin. Now that it is being legitimized by the traditional financial world, the big players are in, Veblen's law begins now. I'm going to close out my talk with this because I think it's important for you all to understand what Veblen's law or what some people refer to as the Veblen effect is. And what this Veblen effect is going to do is it's going to accelerate Bitcoin's advance above $1 million a coin. Some people think that you you would think that the higher it goes, the slower its advance. No, that's wrong, in my opinion. That in this case with Bitcoin, the higher the price goes, the more it will accelerate and the more desirable it will become. So the moves up become more accelerated, not less. This is my prediction. So 
Listen, Veblen's law, which I told you is also known as the Veblen effect, right? It's a phenomenon where the demand for a good increases as the price increases, not decreases. It increases as the price increases because people perceive it as a sign of high quality and status. Bitcoin is going to become, now that it's legitimized, amongst the wealthy, amongst those who have, amongst the world, it's going to be like a Ferrari or it's going to be like a mansion on the hill. It's going to be a symbol of status in the world, which is going to make it incredibly desirable, even amongst people who have none. And this is contrary to the usual law of demand, which typically states that demand decreases as the price goes up. Your demand decreases, but no, Veblen's law is the opposite. Now, this law, guys, it's named after this American economist. I think, what is it? Thorstein Veblen. And he coined the term conspicuous consumption. I don't know if any of you have heard that term, but that term comes from Mr. Veblen himself. Now, what that means is it describes the behavior of wealthy people who buy expensive things, expensive goods, to show off their wealth, their superiority, and their social position. This law, this law or effect, this Veblen effect, this has happened to all of you too. I see it in your post. You're proud of what the amount of Bitcoin you have. That's Veblen's law taking an effect. And the higher it goes, the more you stick your chest out, the more you feel superior. I told you. You didn't listen, I told you. And I will tell you this. Guys, I am not above saying I told you so. I am going to say that. I just want you to know. I'm just telling you up front right now. When some of these things happen, I am I am going when I hope I didn't lose my somebody called me. I hope I didn't lose my connection. When some of these things happen when Bitcoin takes off and all of that. So I'm going to say, I told you, I'm going to stick it in your face. I am going to be a nuisance. You will get tired of me telling you, I told you so. You know why? Because I'm petty like that. I'm just giving you advance warning. I am petty just like that. So get ready. <laughs> but Veblen's effect is going to, in my opinion, take effect, which, if and when it does, will accelerate the price. Because think about it, the higher it goes, the more desirable it becomes, not the less desirable it becomes. Bitcoin will become the ultimate status symbol. And for this reason, amongst many, I am pounding the table every day. In fact, every hour of the day to stack harder. This future that I see, I see with a clarity that, in my opinion, most people don't have. And I see it with a certainty that is incredibly unshakable to me. I don't care what the current price in U.S. dollar terms is. I, it, it means absolutely zero to me. Do you understand? This is nothing in my mind. It is as worrying about what the price is today in my mind is as silly as worrying about the price between 41 cents, 43 cents, 45 cents. What are you doing? The game is just beginning, you bozo. And you're worried about the price? You're putting your little indicators on a chart 
at the beginning? Dude, where did you go to school? This is insane. It's ridiculous. Uh, uh, imagine thinking that Apple in 1995 was the beginning because that's exactly where Bitcoin is in its life. Apple was 15 years old in 1995. Guys, by the way, as an aside, I put my whole life savings into Apple in, in, in 1997. And so, and this was at the time where I had this, the second largest direct access brokerage firm in the country. I bet the whole farm on Apple in 1997. I was early though. And then I bet the next big bet I did was in, um, uh, was with Amazon in 2003. And so anyway, that's an aside. I digress. But imagine thinking that Apple was, you were late or, dude, it didn't matter where you bought in 1995 Apple. Do you understand? This is ridiculous. The asset class just begun yesterday. And you're putting your little freaking silly little indicators talking about overbought and oversold you're dumb i'm sorry i told you i was cocky you're dumb with a capital d this is accumulation time it's not freaking trading time so put your stupid stochastics and your rsi and your little death crosses away you don't do that bullshit at the beginning of something. And we're still at the beginning. The asset class just started yesterday. So stop it. And stop being overly obsessed with U.S. dollar pricing. Just stop it. It's ridiculous now. Down is good. Up is okay right now. Because I will tell you this, I will promise you. Two years from now, four years from now in particular, eight years from now, you're going to wish that this didn't go like that. Like it will. You're going to wish you did more. You're going to experience anguish because you we're being silly about little tiny pennies. Stop majoring in the minor now. That's not how big wealth is created. By majoring in the minor. Get out of the minor. Big money is not made in the minor. This is chess. This is not checkers. You got to think 15 freaking steps down the line. Not, oh, we're up against resistance. Stupid. Have some, get, find a way to get some freaking patience and lengthen out that time frame for Christ's sakes. Nothing happens overnight that is worthwhile. Anything in your life that's happened overnight, you have regretted it. I promise you, think about it. Think about it right now. Something happened right away, you regret it. Look at all the people who win lottery tickets, man. They wind up wishing they never won, right? Come on. Let's do this the right way. Let's do it the institutional way. Accumulate for the next four years, no matter what the price. Do that, people. It's four years. Dude, four years. It's nothing. You can't even get a rinky-dink degree for four years now. Come on. It's four years of your life. Just weekly. Or if you can't weekly, monthly, just put something in for four years. Doesn't matter the price. And the following four years, you're free. That's it. For the rest of your life, all you got to do is give your loyalty and dedication to the most special thing we've ever been in contact with for four years. That's it. That's it. Guys, I will tell you, four years is coming, whether you want to or not. I'll tell you, I will end this talk on a story. My traders know this. They're bored with my stories, but 
some of you are not mine. So I'm very happy to have a captive audience so I can keep telling these stories. Okay. I will, I will end this talk with a story. It's a story of my mom. My father's no longer with us, but my mom still is. My mom never finished. She always wanted to go to, to finish school. She always wanted to finish high school. And not high school, I'm sorry. She always wanted to go to college and, 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 and get a college degree. And so her only, she only had two wishes for me. She wanted me to be a concert pianist, which I spent the majority of my childhood achieve, trying to achieve until I got intoxicated by financial markets. And she wanted me to get a college degree. All right, so I failed her on one. I failed her on one. But I will say this, that she always wanted one for herself, but never thought that was possible. So at the age of... 60, my mother at Thanksgiving dinner shared with her two sisters, my two aunts, I'm going to go back to school. And my aunts immediately started laughing. You're going to go back to school at this age? Actually, she wasn't 60. I'll tell you, she was like 50 two or something at the time. But anyway, I'm going to use 60 because it's a round number. So it's like, you're, you're 60 years old. What are you doing? She's like, do you, my aunts were like cracking up. Do you realize how old you're going to be by the time you graduate? In four years, you're going to be 64. And my mother listened and my mother has this really deep wisdom about her. Like she can drop a single statement and it will just explode like a bomb because it's so packed and powerful and infused with wisdom. And this was one of those bombs she dropped. She listened to everything she said. She watched them laugh. And as they said, do you realize that in four years... You're going to be 64? And she looked up and said, well, in four years, aren't I going to be 64 with a degree or without one? So why not be 64 in four years with one? Mike dropped. My aunts went silent. Four years is coming anyway. Why not let it come with more Bitcoin, way more Bitcoin than you have today? Why not? It's coming anyway. You can let four years from now come with none, or you can just let four years come with some, hopefully a lot. And so when you take this view, if you take this view down becomes good because if you're just if you've if you're living four years out from today do you understand it doesn't matter what bitcoin's doing right now down gives me the a greater opportunity to achieve my four year goal and let me tell you this bitcoin is designed to never fail you in four year periods Ever. It is mathematically designed to be valuable, more valuable, and in a big way, every four years of your life. And you will experience this your entire life. It will never break. It's maths. And your kids will experience it, their lives and their kids. Now, if you don't believe me, it means you need to do more study. You need to go deeper down the rabbit hole. Go to work. Bitcoiners, traders, followers, supporters, even the haters. Go to work. My name is Oliver Velez and I am your 13%er Bitcoiner. Be safe out there and until next time. Boom!